The series starts on August 3, 1896, as the residents of London are startled by a strange noise passing above. Meanwhile, a local widow, Amelia, makes her way down a secluded alleyway and jumps off into the Thames River. Just then, a crystalline flying object emerges from the clouds and emits several small bright-colored exhausts. These exhausts fall over many local people, including Amelia, Penance, Horatio, Malady, Mary, Augustus, and a young girl with Lord Masson. Except for Malady, all witnesses forget what happened as soon as the object disappears. Soon afterwards, Amelia opens her eyes and pulls herself up from the river in which she had just thrown herself, and lays on the ground unexplainable and mysterious. Although the people do not realize it at the moment, everyone who is touched by the mysterious sparkles is gifted with supernatural powers. Three years after the incident, the British Empire still cannot figure out what happened that day, and how to combat the recent play of this superpower they call the Touched. Amidst the ongoing persecution and backlash from the public, the Touched find safety in St. Romalda's orphanage which is financed by wealthy philanthropist Levin Abidlow. Currently, Amelia, the touched with the power to have short glimpses in the future, runs the orphanage. She wakes up and meets her friend Penance, who has the ability to see the flow of electricity, making her a brilliant inventor. The duo then head for Haplish residence after they receive an intel about a possibly touched girl, Myrtle Haplish. As they talk with Myrtle's parents, Amelia finds herself lying on the ground with three young children, a boy and two girls, hovering over her in a brief vision. Amelia and Penance then proceed to introduce themselves to Myrtle who, while unable to speak English, can comprehend it. However, she appears fluent in Chinese, Russian, and Turkish. Mrs. Haplish then suspects that she may have learned Chinese from the acrobats in the park. Later, Amelia hears a thud and rushes upstairs to Myrtle, ordering Penance to keep the Haplish downstairs. She enters Myrtle's room to find two men taking her. One of Myrtle's attackers turns his attention to Amelia, shoving her into the other room. As foretold in her vision, Amelia lies on the ground with a boy and two girls hovering over her. Penance rushes upstairs, and Amelia jumps to her feet. She re-enters the room and combats Myrtle's would-be abductors, tossing one of the attackers out of the window. Amelia then fights with the remaining man. Penance blinds him with her shiner, a tiny explosive device, and Amelia binds his hands before tackling him out the window. Outside on ground level, she finds a group of masked men taking Myrtle. Amelia fends them off with her electroshock umbrella long enough for Penance to pull the carriage around, but she gets wounded in the fight. A brief chase ensues with one of the masked attackers climbing onto the carrier. Amelia commands Penance to initiate her auto carriage prototype, which allows them to escape. Once again, Amelia has a brief glimpse of being at the opera house, so she plans to go there. In the meantime, a Scotland Yard officer, Detective Mundy, is called down into the underground tunnels to investigate the death of an unidentifiable woman whose corpse has marks of stabbing and rat bites. There's a message written in blood on a nearby wall. Behold my works for I am the angle of death. However, Detective Mundy doesn't believe the message is Malady's work, as he knows the notorious killer can spell correctly. He asks the foreman who moved the body, claiming that someone wrote the message in hopes of framing Malady for the murder. Mundy orders for every worker to be checked for blood on their nails and clothes. He then grabs the foreman and demands to know how exactly he altered the crime scene. In the orphanage, Amelia and Penance return safely with Myrtle. Dr. Horatio Cousins greets them and inquires about their journey. Amelia displays her wound and tells Lucy to fetch her a pen and paper to write to Ms. Bidlow about the latest attack. Penance introduces Myrtle to Primrose, who is not only impossibly tall but eager to make friends with someone of her age. She asks that Primrose take Myrtle to get a cup of tea. Meanwhile, Harriet and Anil take a seat inside the auto carriage and agree they should get married inside it. Amelia and Penance share their encounter with the masked attackers with Horatio, Lucy, and Harriet. Amelia suspects that the masked men have been tracking the touched for some time, which would explain all that of the touched girls who allegedly just ran away. That said, they'll be bolstering their security moving forward to protect the touched in their care. Lucy has been teaching some of the girls to defend themselves. Amelia would like for her to extend this to everyone to show the girls how to protect themselves without using their turns. Lastly, Amelia wants to send word to the Beggar King for a meetup, who they pay for protection as well as knowledge of potential candidates. Amelia needs to confirm whether or not he's sharing this information elsewhere. Hugo awakens in bed with a man to his right, and a woman to his left. Drugged, he meets with Augustus, who has taken notice of the crows outside of Hugo's home. They are unhappy and massing nearby. More importantly, 
He's come to talk about his sister and her charity regarding the touched and the orphanage. Augustus shares with Hugo how Lavinia just got word that a young touched girl was attacked but is currently safe. And now, Lavinia is bringing Amelia and Penance to the opera. Hugo asks if they're hideous and advises Augustus to flirt with the ugly one to create an unexpected balance. Augustus is hoping that Hugo will agree to attend the opera as well, to coach him through the evening. Hugo initially turns Augustus down as he has a meeting with the Minister of Finance about the Fairman's Club next midnight carouse. However, he reluctantly agrees under the conditions that Augustus attend the Fairman's. After Augustus leaves, Hugo watches him from the window above as he interacts with the crows. The maid joins him, and Hugo says that Augustus is above reproach and beneath contempt. In the meantime, Horatio heals Amelia's wound using his turn. She tells him that with a gift like his, he should be a royal physician, not patching up gangsters and freaks. However, Horatio's turn has branded him a voodoo witch doctor in the eyes of many. Myrtle interrupts with a dress and invitation to the opera from Lavinia Bidlow. That evening, Amelia and Penance leave the orphanage headed for the opera house. They come to a sudden stop and, within moments, they're joined inside their carriage by Declan Oron, the beggar king. He introduces them to his new henchman, Odium, a large and smelly man by the window. Declan tells Amelia that there are channels they must go through to contact him. She tells him about the attack on Myrtle Haplish and her suspicion that the masked attackers have been tracking the touched for some time. They're a danger to the touched and to anyone known to be connected to them, which Amelia has made sure Declan was known far and wide to be, forcing him to help them. Amelia questions if Declan sold Myrtle's information to anyone else. He replies that nothing is exclusive except his marriage. For a price of his choosing, Amelia needs the name of whoever is hunting the touched and why. They offer him an automated motor carriage as a gift for today, and payment if he helps them. Leaving the carriage, Declan pulls a blade from his pocket, and threatens to kill Amelia should she not uphold her end of the bargain. She tells him this isn't her face, which bewilders him as they leave. One of his henchmen laughs at it, so the beggar king demands that he spread his fingers wide. Amelia and Penance arrive at the opera house. Inside the theater, Lavinia, Augustus, Dr. Belden, Mrs. Belden, Hugo, and Lord Masson discuss ancient prejudices and the specificity of modern languages, such as the differentiation between the employed and the French employee. Amelia and Penance join them and the topic shifts to their afflictions, a term that Amelia doesn't acknowledge as being true to the touched. While some women are more fortunate in the nature of their ailments than others, Amelia believes that more suffer from society's perception than their own debilitation. Augustus loudly asks what's wrong with the two ladies. Amelia explains that Penance is an inventor, able to see potential energy, and where it wants to go, move, or settle, allowing her to put things together, whereas Amelia sees glimpses of the future. During the opera, the crowd shrieks at the sudden arrival of Malady, who makes her presence known when she slits the throat of an actor dressed as the devil. She is accompanied by Bonfire and Wine Recruits. Malady tells one of the actresses it's not her fault. But the doctors, Amelia has a brief vision of Malady climbing the balcony to attack her. Malady then announces that she has come to kill an angel witch, but, the closer she came, the more she felt she was there for a reason. She claims to have seen God, who put his wreath on her, whereas they turned their back on him. She adds that he sings, but she can't make the sound out, though she can feel his presence. Malady's henchman fires into the crowd, shooting, among others, Dr. and Mrs. Belden, causing the audience to scatter. As Bonfire creates a fireball, one of the stage performers, Mary, begins to sing. Her voice garners the attention of Malady and several others, including Amelia, Penance, and Augustus. Malady covers the singer's mouth and scurries out the back with Mary and Bonfire. Amelia jumps down onto the stage and disarms the henchman before following Malady and Bonfire backstage, where they cross paths with Hugo and Katie. Amelia jumps down several flights of stairs and confronts Malady. A fight ensues and Malady's eyes begin to glow orange. She delivers blow after blow to Amelia, but Malady and Bonfire flee with Mary when the police arrive. Detective Mundy interviews Hugo about the attack on the theater. Hugo reveals that the girl abducted is someone they both know. The two begin to discuss their nefarious business dealings, though Inspector Mundy doesn't profit from their exchange. Hugo says that, once he has enough girls and a certain investor becomes interested, the Fairman's Club will become not just a profitable business, but a phenomenon. Dr. Haig complains to one of the masked men who is tasked with bringing Myrtle to him. He declares that every subject gets him closer to finding exactly where they're touched. Unable to do so today, Dr. Haig inserts a drill inside the man's wounded skull, who screams in pain. Penance follows the sound of commotion down an alleyway to Amelia, who is fighting two drunk men. 
She tells Penance that she lost the girl to Malady, but she suspects that Malady won't kill Mary, at least not immediately. Penance recalls the feeling she had when Mary sang. It reached into her and everyone that's touched, confirming that they belong. Should they find Mary and get her to sing? The others will come to them. Penance assures Amelia. Rosa and Elisabetta arrive at work at the Jones and Jackson store discussing the touched and varying turns. Mr. Oldenham reprehends Elisabetta's withered gloves and she explains that she's saving up for a new pair. Mr. Oldenham approaches her and begins to talk about a cafe when they are interrupted by a customer in search of a new hat. Elisabetta touches a hat with her hold glove and causes it to levitate. The store erupts in chatter upon discovering that she's touched. Mr. Oldenham orders her to stay, but Elisabetta flees into a back alley with a flyer for St. Romalda's orphanage. Inspector Mundy raids the orphanage in search of Malady. Lucy's aware of his history of knocking suspects about, even if they're innocent. Inspector Mundy suspects that Amelia was involved in Malady's attack on the opera house, but Penance insists that she's innocent. She reminds the inspector that if not for Amelia, they wouldn't even have Malady's riflemen whom Mrs. True subdued herself. Inspector Mundy asks Amelia about Mary Brighton, and if she's touched, she confirms it, but she denies answering about Mary's turn. Miss Bidlow arrives, having consulted with the commissioner of police, and instructs Mundy to leave. Lavinia talks alone with Amelia and Penance, with three of the touched having declared war on society. Everyone at the orphanage is suspect in the eyes of the law. Lavinia reveals that the superintendent was pressured from above to order the warrant but he couldn't tell her by whom. Amelia suspects Lord Masson may be behind the raid. Moving forward, Lavinia informs Penance about her monthly charitable fate, and how this month it will be held at her estate. She says that a few attractive girls showing off their turns and their good manners to society's elite will hopefully alter society's perception of the touched. She's hoping Penance will lead the occasion and bring a few of the girls with her. Lord Masson, Lord Broughton, and Douglas Broom further discuss the touched and the manner in which Malady has turned sentiment against them in the eyes of society. The House will nominate a special committee on the touched, which will consist of the three of them. Regarding the attack at the Opera House, Lord Masson intends to keep the statement on the attack vague and wrathful, with no mention of Amelia True, who they begin to wonder is at the root of their feminine plague. Lord Masson approaches Hugo about a rumor regarding the Ferriman's Club, which Hugo intends to turn into an actual business, and among his entertainers are a few of the touched. Lord Masson refuses to allow Hugo to operate such an establishment in a public arena due to the public fear and outcast of the touched. However, Hugo notes that requests for membership into the Ferriman's Club have doubled since the attack on the Opera House, declaring that horror and fascination go arm and arm. When Hugo makes an offhand remark about his father and his deteriorating mind, Lord Masson grabs him by his jacket and reminds Hugo that Alastair Swan had one of the brightest minds in all of England. Hugo, however, remembers his father more for his fists. He then tells Lord Masson that the Ferriman's opens tonight. Lord Masson remarks that he used to think that Hugo's father's mind worsened because Hugo's brother Caleb drowned, but it's more likely because Hugo didn't. Amelia and Penance discuss which girls will accompany Penance to Lavinia's party. Harriet's turn is charming. Primrose never goes out, as she's shy about her stature, which is why Myrtle will be joining them, as she calms Primrose. Lastly, they decide to send Lucy, who can defend them should the evening go awry. Penance begins to wonder why Miss Bidlow would start an orphanage. Amelia believes that it's because she knows what it's like to be dismissed. In case Amelia finds Malady before their return from Lavinia's party, Penance has constructed a pair of enhanced glasses that'll hopefully offset Malady's eye glow. Penance is also working on a prototype blaster to disarm Bonfire Annie, though it remains in its early stages of development. Rosa catches up to Elisabetta as she is fleeing the lodging house. She questions why Elisabetta never told her she was touched. Elisabetta's family kicked her out when her turn first manifested, so she didn't know who she could trust. The authorities arrive and Rosa gives up her location. Elisabetta runs off, obstructing the officer's passage with levitating wooden crates. Penance, Lucy, Harriet, Primrose, and Myrtle arrive at Lavinia's party. She tells them to mingle without putting themselves forward. Lavinia reminds them that the mission is to amuse, not alarm the guests. She has also requested for each of them to wear a blue ribbon to identify them. Desiree Blodgett arrives at the orphanage with her son Nigel seeking refuge. While meeting Desiree, Amelia has a rippling of herself and Malady engaged in combat. Desiree tells her that she's a renowned whore, diva of desire. Over the years, she's cultivated an impressive clientele of men of stature who often divulge their secrets and feelings to her. However, she discovered that one of her regulars plans to have her killed, as he told her himself during their last exchange. She simply needs a place to stay until it's safe. Amelia asks who sent her. 
Desiree claims that one of her clients informed her about the orphanage, but refuses to give a name. Amelia suspects that Desiree is after something and begins to ramble on about the Beggar King and Malady. She then noticed this is Desiree's turn, forcing people who are worked up to inadvertently reveal what's on their mind. Amelia takes Desiree to the police station to meet with Inspector Mundy. Amelia smacks him in the face to upset him, and asks him about the partial picture of Mary that he showed her at the orphanage. Mundy shows her the photo of himself with Mary and reveals that they were engaged, but that she left him standing by the altar. Amelia asks Desiree to leave the room, and Mundy points his gun at Amelia. She tells him that she's going after Malady. She came to Mundy because she needed to be sure that he cared more about saving Mary than capturing Malady. Amelia reveals to him that Mary's turn is a song only the touched can hear. Mary is chained up inside a large industrial building, where Clara asks Mary to sing for her. Clara says that if she hears it then that means she's finally touched. But Mary tells Clara that she's not. Clara replies that she's working for her turn through sacrifice, having already sacrificed her little toes, but that wasn't enough. The colonel mocks Clara and throws a turkey leg on the ground for Mary to eat. She grabs the food but, before she bites, the illusion fades and she discovers that it's actually a dead rat. Bonfire Annie scolds the two for harassing Mary, as they were given strict instructions to leave her be. Bonfire then reports to Malady with Amelia's name and address. However, Malady needs something she can shake at Amelia, such as a pretty dolly but that will prove impossible with all of London searching for them. Malady then approaches Mary and asks why did she sing that night at the opera house. Mary admits that she was afraid more people would get hurt, and that's when her turn manifests. She knew that Malady would hear it and maybe it would be a reassurance that she needn't act only from pain. Harriet, Primrose, and Myrtle display their turns for the guests. Augustus joins Penance and Lucy and compliments the latter's elephant brooch. Penance made it for Lucy to commemorate her mom who ran with the 40 Elephants gang. Aji then offers to show Penance the paintings in the next room over. Now alone, Penance asks Augustus if he knew before the opera house that he was touched. He explains that he's always been keen on birds, particularly corvids, and on multiple occasions, he has dreamt that he was a crow soaring over the countryside. One day it happened one day when he wasn't asleep, in the church, one moment he was in the pew and the next he was in the sky, controlling the birds above. He's worried that one day he will lose control and won't be able to come back. Elisabetta reaches the address in the flyer for St. Romalda's Orphanage. A woman at the door invites her in, but, once inside, two masked men capture her. Mary and Malady discuss her stalled career in the opera. She asks if Mary was harvested early and reaches up her skirt, but Mary pushes her away. Mary asks what it is that Malady is after. She reveals that she's searching for a thorn crown that she can't stop seeing. God made her see and remember the day he came which only she can remember. She thought she was chosen because her agony made her special, but Mary is pleasant and gifted her with abilities as well. She believes that God is mocking her with Mary's song, and that he sent a demon after her, Amelia, who she refers to as the woman who sheds her skin. She's coming for his song, Malady adds. Malady then punches Mary when she tries to convince her to orchestrate a ransom. Malady then proceeds to ramble on about God wanting them to hurt, which Mary disagrees with. Amelia describes the nature of her turn to Inspector Mundy. All she knows for certain from her last rippling is that she's punching Malady. From what little they have on her, Amelia concludes that Malady was abused by doctors and probably as a child as well, causing confusion between pain and pleasure. Mundy suspects that Malady is mocking God with her message at each crime scene. But Amelia argues that she loves him and would do anything to please him. Amelia still isn't sure how Mary fits in. But she believes that Malady took her because she felt a power greater than pain. When she heard Mary's song, Penance explains to Augustus the workings of electricity, how it moves and circles the air. Augustus compares it to when birds are moving as one in a murmuring. Harriet interrupts to inform Penance that some of the guests are wagering on whether Lucy can break the statue of Aphrodite in the garden. Lavinia warns Augustus not to get too close to Penance, as people see them walking away together. She reminds Augustus that the touched are her charity. If the guests suspect that Penance has social ambitions or is using a turn to bewitch him, the reports of their event could be disastrous for them, and possibly dangerous for her. Lavinia blames herself for having failed to notice why he's been acting odd since the opera. She now realizes that he likes Penance, but he is not clever enough to keep a mistress. She says that they most certainly can't have a girl who is touched and Irish bears the Bidlow name. Penance reconvenes with Augustus, who is no longer interested in continuing their conversation, and excuses himself. Having witnessed the exchange, Lucy approaches Penance, 
and suggests they leave. Penance rushes out of the estate alone and rides off in the auto carriage. Unbeknownst to her, a crow under Augustus' control briefly follows her. Mundy tells Amelia that Malady and her gang are known to hold up at warehouses and church cellars. They spent three weeks in the honeymoon suite at Claridge's, with the colonel's turn to make people believe anything. He kept telling the manager he was the Prince of Wales. Amelia suddenly has another rippling that reveals Malady is hidden at Southwark and Vauxhall Water Works, recognizing it from a photo pinned on Mundy's map, though she keeps this to herself. Amelia exits his office claiming to have to use the restroom and hands Desiree the photo. She instructs Desiree to give it to the inspector when he inevitably comes looking for her. Elisabetta struggles and prays while strapped to a procedure chair. Just as Dr. Haig is about to cut her skull, his assistant tells him that the boss is coming. Amelia arrives at Malady's hideout and puts on Penance's custom glasses. She goes down into the boiler room, where she hears the sound of distant laughter. Bonfire directs down the path by blocking the wrong turns with fire. Augustus enters the Fairman's Club, where Hugo greets him. Hugo says that, after the attack at the opera, he realized that the touched are the future and has decided to employ them at his business. Now, all Hugo needs is a small investment from Aji, not with money, but Aji's signature as the Bidlow name on the contracts will lend legitimacy. Hugo then leads Aji to two women and he goes with them. Amelia confronts Malady and demands to know the whereabouts of Mary. Malady says that she has to shed first, before attacking Amelia with a blade. Amelia dodges her attack and proceeds to beat her who quickly recovers with her eyes glowing bright orange. She then points up to Mary, who is with a noose around her neck standing on the edge of the platform above them. Malady says that Mary can drop and that Amelia can shed her skin. She then refers to Amelia as Molly. Amelia replies, Sarah. Malady accuses Amelia of feeding her to them. She woke up every morning with their teeth that cut her, chewed her, and raped her into tiny pieces. Malady says that she endured two years of it while Amelia thrived and never looked back despite claiming they were friends. Amelia apologizes, claiming that she didn't have a choice, as she had a mission. Malady explains that she has a mission of her own. Since Mary is Amelia's new best friend, she must be done with Penance, who is on the opposite end of the platform, also with a noose around her neck. Amelia must choose which to save. Malady hands Amelia a gun and tells her to shoot one to save the other. Amelia shoots herself and falls to the ground. Malady rushes over and Amelia shoots her in the shoulder. When Malady attempts to kill Amelia, Bonfire Annie sends a fireball her way. Malady flees with Colonel and Clara as Inspector Mundy arrives with the police. Amelia is taken to Horatio, who manages to heal her wounds, though it will not be an immediate recovery. Penance expresses her anger with Amelia, explaining that there's no place in heaven for those who scorn their own life. Amelia claims that she knew Horatio would be able to save her. Penance then joins her in the bed as she rests. Amelia explains there's a history between herself and Malady. Penance says that, for now, she just wants to celebrate them being alive. Mundy checks in on Mary who has decided to stay in the orphanage. Mary tells him she refuses to ignore who she is any longer. Frank asks if being touched is why Mary didn't go through with the wedding, but she would rather not answer. Dr. Haig meets with the boss. Lavinia arrives in the underground tunnels, where there's an excavation around a bright colored orb. What Haig mistakes for fun, Miss Bidlow says it's war. The workers are all walking in line, including Elisabetta, who bears a large scar on her head. Episode 3 of The Nevers begins with Bonfire Annie heading down to the docks to find the Beggar King. However, Amelia and Penance both show up and manage to stop her burning the place. Annie admits she doesn't know where Malady is, and shrugs off Amelia's suggestion that she join their ranks. In the morning, Dr. Horatio arrives to check up on Amelia. He's concerned about her recklessness and comments solemnly on how many times she's been brought in to be patched up. Her decision to bring Annie into the fold has raised more than a few eyebrows too. Afterwards, Amelia and Penance discuss their new project which includes creating an amplifier for Mary. Or, as Penance calls it, the brightening. They want to try and enhance Mary's song and spread it across the city. Alone, Mary confronts Amelia and asks her what she's supposed to be doing. Amelia is cagey, admitting she knows things that others don't. However, she's not about to disclose that anytime soon. Right now, she wants Mary to sing. However, this fellow touch tells her she doesn't know why she should. Meanwhile, the Beggar King questions his men over fleeing from Annie and not facing her head on. After stabbing one of his longer-serving lackeys in the gut, the big man takes off. At the same time, Dr. Horatio is encouraged to head into his carriage, where Malady happens to be. She's in a rough way but wants him to patch her up. After doing just that, she kicks Horatio out and takes off. Amelia heads off to visit Lucy, who follows Mr. Haig's flyers up around town. 
she manages to stop an animatronic assassin from taking out the girls and eventually brings Lucy back to the orphanage. With all the touch together, including Desiree, Lucy admits she works for a tall man with a fur coat. Apparently, he does experiments on the girls, but doesn't give up much more than that. Frank Mundy heads over to the sanctuary to see Mary. She promises never to hate him, admitting that he'll always be the man she calls when she runs into trouble. Frank smiles and tentatively asks whether he can see her sing. Although only the touch can actually see it, he wants to at least try and experience this for her. Later that day, Amelia is attacked by a touched who can walk on water. A pretty slick fight then ensues, with this man called Odium attacking Amelia while she tries to fend him off in the water. It's a really well shot fight, with the camera moving between the moments on the surface and under the stream. Eventually, Amelia manages to choke the big man out, killing him with his own chains. With all the touched gathered together and Mary starting to sing, the amplifier kicks in and starts working, at least to begin with. Gunshots suddenly rain down from afar as Malady's gunman kills Mary. As she slumps to the ground, Mundy heads after the assassin and shoots him. In the closing scene, Heading back to the sanctuary grief-stricken and defeated, Annie stands waiting for them. She's accompanied by numerous women and children, presumably those who all have touched abilities, and stands with a flaming hand above her hand. The flames dance off their expectant faces, 